Okay. So our first speaker this afternoon is Ryan Haney. He's a senior at the Kansas City Art Institute. And today he will be speaking to us about Orpheus and Felix Gonzalez Torres, A Paradigm of Loss and Redemption. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Emily. Okay. The tragedy of Orpheus and his lost love Eurydice has enamored both artists and poets for millennia. Once conceived from early Greek folklore and literature, Orpheus as entrusted liar has since journeyed their way throughout history, with many recognizing the lonely musician as the shepherd of the arts and as the ultimate paradigm for unequivocal love and equally unwavering despair. According to literary historian Kenneth Gross Louise, quote, poets writing love lyrics promised to be as loyal to their ladies as Orpheus had been to Eurydice, to advertise their loveliness with equal fervor and suffer their absence with equal intensity, unquote. After Felix Gonzalez Torres lost his own partner, Ross Laycock, to age-related complications in 1991, he too would turn to the Orpheus myth as a means of contextualizing his own tragedy. In this paper, I'll discuss how a Greek fantasy informed Gonzalez Torres' understanding of an otherwise incomprehensible reality. By doing so, I will further analyze the ways in which Gonzalez Torres' broader use of abstraction allowed him to both mirror and subvert the Orpheus myth's various interpretations throughout history. The myth itself has been reimagined within various artistic genres throughout the Western canon and has evolved from being the inspiration behind Shakespearean sonnets to being the muse of the modern artist, such as Osama Noguchi, who once proclaimed the Orpheus tale as, quote, the story of the artist itself, unquote. But why is it that artists throughout history have had such a profound interest in reimagining the specific legends? Gross Louise believes that it is a matter of preservation through revision, saying that, quote, myths to remain alive must constantly be revised in such a way that they can become, without losing their basic psychological and archetypal importance, part of an age's language and thought, unquote. By viewing this idea within an artistic context, it could be said that the artist has developed a distinguished role in preserving Orpheus as a cultural figure. In utilizing Orpheus as the culmination of their romance and despair, artists are able to infuse the conditions of their age within the context of the myth's broader timeline. For Felix Gonzalez Torres, the conditions of his time became mercilessly influential toward both himself and his partner, Ross Laycock. As gay men during the peak of the AIDS crisis, they both experienced tragedy in ways that had been largely unprecedented. From the scorn of the common American to the infamous silence that permeated throughout the highest levels of government, the epidemic known as the gay plague was met with festering ignorance. In 1991, the same year that Laycock died of AIDS-related complications, the National Center for Epidemiology and Population Health ran a survey of the American public which found that the majority of them felt more sympathy towards those who had died of excessive alcohol or tobacco usage than those who had died of AIDS-related causes. Due to its misconception as an exclusively gay disease, the virus was permitted as a just retribution for an already marginalized community. The disturbing sociopolitical climate that enveloped the virus and its victims will become of significant importance to Felix Gonzalez Torres, especially after Laycock's death. The turmoil that surrounded Gonzalez Torres in 1991 consequently fueled the realization of his most iconic works, such as Untitled Orpheus Twice. Consisting of two static mirrors, both slightly over six feet in height, the work was a continuation of Gonzalez Torres' fascination with abstraction, specifically through methods of met metaphorical duality. What separates this work, however, from other aesthetically similar pieces of his such as the dual circular mirrors that comprise Untitled March 5th, number one, is the context of its peculiar title. The use of literature and mythology was extremely uncharacteristic of Gonzalez Torres. Many of his titles were instead informed by his personal life, with several works being labeled with obscure yet intimate allusions to Laycock. This then begs the question, why would Gonzalez Torres allude to a bygone fantasy as a means of comprehending his own stifled reality? When searching beyond the aesthetic simplicity of the artist's work, his motives become clear. The mirrors themselves were inspired by 20th century filmmaker John Cocteau's interpretation of the myth, the film simply titled Orpheus, where a young poet attempts to save his dead partner by using his mirror as a portal to the underworld. 
Felix Gonzalez Torres similarly utilized the mirror as a means of wish fulfillment. Yet he also subverted the heterosexual underpinnings that previous iterations of the Orpheus myth have conveyed. The parenthesized Orpheus twice, as well as the duality that the identical mirrors possess, suggests the homosexual relationship, one that responded to the reality of the artist's experience during the AIDS crisis. The mirror itself is a simple yet effective metaphor for the Orpheus tale, as it elicits the moment that Orpheus and Eurydice journeyed out from the chasms of the underworld. After subduing Hades to tears to the anguish that emanated from his lyre, Orpheus would be granted Eurydice's return to the mortal world, but on one condition. Orpheus could not gaze upon Eurydice during their journey out, or else she would be pulled back down to the underworld forever. Just moments before escaping, Orpheus would become seduced by the temptation of beholding his partner. As he finally succumbed to his desperation, he would peer back at Eurydice, who would subsequently fall back down forever into the abyss. More than anything, this tale evokes the true power of absence, as well as the human urge to grasp and cling onto what has been lost to the void. In Untitled Orpheus Twice, this phenomenon is captured within the mirror's reflective quality, which allows the viewer to peer behind while simultaneously looking straight ahead. With the knowledge of both the Orpheus myth and of Felix Gonzalez Torres' personal reality, this dynamic can be interpreted in a multitude of ways. One interpretation can classify the work as a solution, since the viewer can look ahead while also having the comfort of knowing that their partner is near their side. Another could be that of a curse, where the viewer is tasked with a reminder of the void that surrounds them. In the case of both Gonzalez Torres and his mythical counterpart, this reminder would elicit a sense of absence as their partners are but apparitions of the past, a missing entity behind their physical being. However, like most works by Gonzalez Torres, there is always an underlying sense of hope. As one viewer fills their mirror, another viewer can occupy the other, thus canceling out the loneliness of the individual beholder. The sense of fulfillment through coupling is one of the artist's most persistent themes. In the words of art historian Nancy Spector, quote, in Gonzalez Torres' ideal world, people do not endure alone. They survive in pairs. As part of loving couples who age together, no longer in danger of premature separation caused by incurable and inexplicable diseases, unquote. By initiating conversations about the AIDS epidemic through both personal and symbolic resources, the artist was able to modernize the Orpheus myth in a way that helped normalize homosexual relationships, specifically his own with Ross Laycock. Like Gonzalez Torres, Orpheus acted as a devoted partner who sang for his lost Eurydice until he himself met his premature and brutal end. According to the Roman poet Virgil, who was one of the first to adapt the myth, Orpheus was in fact murdered by a scornful mob, which tore him limb from limb out of jealousy. Despite Eurydice's absence, Orpheus remained ever faithful by ignoring all of the suitors who crossed his path, and it was due to the widower's unwavering loyalty that he met his ultimate demise. Just as Orpheus had sung songs for Eurydice, Felix Gonzalez Torres made his artwork specifically for Laycock. According to an interview with curator Robert Storr, the artist was most concerned with the ways in which his work could overcome the mortal distance that separated him from his lost partner. Quote, when people ask me, who is your public? I say honestly, without skipping a beat, Ross, the public was Ross, unquote. However, in spite of what his comments might suggest, his work relied heavily on viewer participation, often using it as a means of conveying ideas of loss and responsibility. Many of Gonzalez Torres' works, such as his various piles, challenge the viewer to partake, partake in the decay of a metaphorical human form. The viewer would become tasked with the dismemberment of a human being, specifically a homosexual, through an entitled Portrait of Ross in LA, whose collective weight in candy is equivalent to what was once Laycock's ideal weight before he contracted AIDS. This dynamic draws an important parallel to the death of Orpheus. Just as Orpheus had been torn to pieces by a belligerent horde, a docile public can equally ravage Laycock's abstracted presence. To the artist, this mode of interaction was a way of igniting dialogue about the AIDS crisis without overtly offending his viewers with so-called homosexual art. According to Gonzalez Torres, quote, 
it is going to be very difficult for members of Congress to tell their constituents that money is being expended for the promotion of homosexual art when all they have to show are two plugs side by side, or two mirrors side by side, or two light bulbs side by side, unquote. For the artist, the discourse arises from the viewer's initiative to act. Whether the work is activated by the subtle sucking of the candy, through the ethereal occupation of a doubled mirror, or through the contemplation of light itself, the public is always held responsible for the fulfillment of each object's destiny. Gonzalez Torres's participatory work relies heavily on the concept of travel as well. Once a print or a candy leaves the gallery setting, it becomes an individual entity that advances from the detached confines of an art space and into the real world. Through this journey, the work begins to live in an existence beyond its creator and becomes one with its own mortality. According to the artist, quote, when you travel, it's also about dying. In the end, it's about death, unquote. Gonzalez Torres' fascination with ephemerality came out of his own hyper-awareness towards his personal health as the AIDS virus slowly ate away at his physical being. Through travel, both he and Laycock could quietly extend the worldly presence through the aura of delicate paper and tender candy. In this manner, either by being paired in unison or by being hidden safely in masses, Gonzalez Torres could save himself and his partner from their early deaths to the metaphorical habitation of meaningful objects. In Virgil's adaptation of Orpheus, his protagonist similarly journeys to revive his significant other. The concept of travel as a means of redemption has in fact been a persistent theme throughout literary history. According to Nancy Spector, quote, it'd be difficult to name a work in the Western literary canon from Homer, Virgil, and Ovid through Melville and Hemingway that does not rehearse the theme of travel in some manner, unquote. Through traveling objects, Gonzalez Torres ensured that in spite of the bodily damage caused by the AIDS virus, he and Laycock could journey beyond their deaths, forever hovering above that ever dark abyss. Travel is perhaps the most engaging way in which Gonzalez Torres acts as a contemporary Orpheus figure, since Orpheus himself also managed to continue his journey after his death. As Greek relics from antiquity have suggested, the mythological shepherd of the arts survived his brutal dismemberment as a severed yet fully conscious head. Many examples of red figure pottery depict Orpheus's head flanked by two figures, which are often depicted as eager listeners. In this example on the right, Orpheus's head is illustrated alongside Apollo and a scribe. Apollo is shown reaching over the head while authoritatively pointing at the young scribe, as if to command him to write down and acknowledge all of Orpheus's wisdom. The existence of Orpheus as a respected figure, even after his death, illustrates a parallel with Gonzalez Torres' current influence as a voice for a bygone generation. Through sheer desperation, the artist was able to produce work that can interact and communicate with viewers in a way that he knew he one day could not. This desperation manifested from his desire to create work that he and Laycock could inhabit and journey through because he knew that he could not rely on his failing body for closure. According to a Gonzalez Torres, quote, this work originated from my fear of losing everything. This work is about controlling my own fear, unquote. By the time of his death in 1996, Gonzalez Torres had spent years responding to the AIDS crisis through redemptive dualities. In doing so, he both embraced and subverted the traditions that the Orpheus myth had set in place for classical genres such as romance and mortality. Now, as we attempt to grasp the brutal reality that he and many other lovers of his era have left behind, we must also attempt to understand the power of fantasy. His work might cast its audience in grief, just as Orpheus's lyre for which its own unsuspecting public. However, if we are to weep for Gonzalez Torres, just as demons wallowed over Orpheus, we should not do so solely out of remorse. Rather, we should do so with the sincerity of knowing what it is like to hope in the face of the void. If there is anything that should be grasped from Gonzalez Torres' work is that this essence, essence of immortal hope can be materialized, and the right objects can usher in the reincarnation of an abstracted, foregone presence. Felix Gonzalez Torres and Ross Laycock will indeed persevere through their deaths, just as Orpheus once did. This time, however, they will do so with the grace and stillness of objects. 
through mirrors, papers, and piles upon piles of sweetened candy. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I really enjoyed um, the comparison you had between um, the artist and the story of Orpheus. I really enjoyed that. And Dr. Rislow posed the question: Did Doc, excuse me, did Gonzalez Torres cite or acknowledge the 1950 Cocteau film in reference to discussing this work? Yeah, so in an interview with the curator Robert Storr, which was conducted, I think, um, around the time of the work's creation, um, he did specifically reference that film um, as far as the, the material influence for the work. Um, beyond that, a lot of his, uh, he likes to talk about his work in a very ambiguous way, um, very purposefully. Um, and a lot of that is in reference and sort of a subversion of uh, minimalist art at the time, which is why he has a lot of his work untitled and then parentheses title um, is sort of an acknowledgement of what he's after, but also the, uh, a subversion of it at the same time. Emily, are you having sound issues? Oh, okay. Emily, do you need me to jump in? Are you having sound issues? Uh, Ryan, you cite uh, older Orpheus images, but are there any artists contemporary with Gonzalez Torres who also engage with this story? Um, I'm not sure about the specific story of Orpheus, uh, but it is very popular for contemporary artists to refer back to classical myths. Um, for example, Personally, I know Bruce Nauman um, likes to, from time to time, refer back to uh, mythical sources. Same with artists like um, Paul McCarthy. Um, mm -hmm. It is a very popular um, source of information. And within postmodernism, uh, often, more often than not, it's a subversion of those classical myths. So for Bill Gonzalez Torres himself, the subversion was to reconsider the heteronormative aspects of the story. Um, and to apply it to the conceptual art movement. So is this the, you mentioned that the literary reference is unusual. So, I mean, he's often using some sort of untitled or it's rather um, yeah. innocuous, but is there any other example where he does use a literary reference or is this really the only example of this? This is the only example I could find Okay. Um, a, lot, a lot of the titles, specifically, the series of work is his most is most well known. Um, okay. They have uh, some works from before uh, Ross, his partner, died. Mm -hmm. um, that series of puzzles that he did, where he would take um, family photos or photos of him and Ross together and reorganize them into puzzles. Um, but more often than not, he followed the format of having. The title of the work be untitled and then parentheses it would be either an, a really obscure reference to a date for example like um, untitled march 5th number one and two uh which the data that is very ambiguous whether or not it's the perhaps the data of ross's death um in 1991 um that might that might be um something that's related to but he never publicly expresses um what those titles are referring to so yeah, I would say this is the only one I could find that spe specifically references. Yeah, it's that um, ever-present problem of the artist not telling you what you want to right. know, 
right? Yes. Uh, so I'm curious, we just have like another minute left, but can you share with us um, how you became interested in this topic? Like what led you to go down this path? And even, uh, I don't know, I'm just imagining you sitting and paging through and suddenly coming across this really strange reference to it where he's using a title that has this literary um, connection that is so out of character for him. Sure, yeah. So um, it is very personally motivated. So um, I have gay parents. Um, one of them has had the AIDS virus since uh, the early 90s. And both of them met each other after losing their prior, prior partners to the virus. So um, it is a very personal subject for me. And when I first came in contact with Gonzalez Torres's work, um, the way it was first kind of introduced to me was I was I think I was 14 years old on a on a field trip to a local local museum and we saw the the Ross Laycock piece with the pile of candy um, and the curator just said oh it's um it's a pile of free candy you can just take as much candy as you want and that was a, that was all the context that was given so we all took the candy went on the bus and then think twice about it um, and it wasn't until I uh, got into undergrad that I sort of started revisiting the work and really started to obviously get that appreciation for it um, on a both intellectual and personal level. Um, and this work specifically struck me because as you as you pointed out, it's the only work to refer to a specific literary text or a specific reference outside of his personal life, which I was really interested in. And I wanted to know more about what the influence behind that was. And that was the inspiration behind it. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for sharing that and helping us you know, understand your perspective in approaching this. And uh, I don't know if you plan to take this research further, but we'll look forward to seeing if it um, shows up in a publication somewhere or, uh, or the like. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, I think that Emily is having some audio, is continuing to have some audio issues. 